this brings to a very interesting session of uh, asuma con for last one and a half days another two and a half days we have been working on how to improve the quality, how to improve uh, the treatment outcomes of breast cancer patients now this oration is entirely different this is one of the most sort of sessions of uh, our annual conference presidential oration professor chintamani is uh, he's like you know uh, a great teacher great mentor wonderful friend super human being he is the president of our organization president governor of american college of surgeons international surgical advisor royal college of surgeons of edinburgh uk member academy of master surgeons educators american college of surgeons is founding co chair of breast global as well fellow royal society of medicine president association of ex president of association of breast surgeons of india so you know there it's like long list i'm sorry sir i i won't read all of this because uh, one thing which i have actually learned from him is people will know you by your deeds and not what is written on this board and i think in last uh, two and a half days we have come across what a man he is very particular particular i'm the ceo of the organization and you'll find me outside the door he is the president of the organization and you find him on the chair so that's how particular he is about his work this session is going to be very different from breast this is going to be the topic is third dimension telling you this life outside this also and how you should live this sir i won't waste time and ladies and gentlemen i present to you professor chintamani for president celebration please give him a big round of applause thank you very much shubham that's very kind and i'm sure you had wonderful teaching and learning sessions the last two and a half days and as uttam insisted it has to be something different so let's see if it makes sense different it is but so a very good afternoon to everyone so the moment you mention a breast surgeon you, the, the image of a breast surgeon comes in your mind but please understand we are all surgeons to begin with and breast is just an organ that you work on if you go with that holistic approach it is much simpler rather than the tubular approach starting from the breast and then thinking about the rest of the body it's a beautiful quote from misha upanishad the great way is not different for those who make no preferences so if you already made a choice and you're firmly on it it's very very much like the surgery where if you're rigid about what you're doing excuse me sir later so it is a choice that you make and if eventually that's what you become the prison of so we should be flexible we should be open to ideas now how do you define dimensions well all dimensions exist at the same time so there's nothing like one or two or three or four dimensions and they're generally occupying the same space just that they are occurring at different vibrations or frequencies of energy and if you sum it up we are nothing but a bundle of energy and that's how we share vibrations and there are lots of energy that you can see in this room and hopefully all of it is positive and that's how it works so even a thought which is positive reverses faster than we think it may not look to be making an impact impact but eventually it does now this is that famous dreyfus model for skill based science surgical excellence unidimensional and we get absolutely stereotyped into workaholics who are spending the whole day trying to excel and we get into this unidimensional journey which actually translates into a rat race the tragedy of a rat race is the winner and loser both are rats you can see that you learn then you get better as a novice you get become an advanced learner then you become a, a competent person then you start teaching and it is in the maslow's model of life that you see the self actualization which happens much later in life makes you think back and imagine as to what life could have been and you could have done differently but while you're traveling we often miss the third dimension which is your shadow it's in the depth and that exa exactly is what is going to make a difference eventually 
because it's one thing being involved in something passionately and the other thing being happy and joyful about it. Happiness is physical, joyfulness is spiritual, as they say. It's very similar to a drop in a calm water. As it drops, it sends ripples and they are the vibrations that go around and they open up all the dimensions and that's when we start thinking as to what are we doing and why are we doing it. I'll just give you a brief gist of how I traveled it. People have traveled it much better and they've got a better story to tell. But each story is important. You're not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. So if you need to study the ocean, you can study the drop. Like we say in the body, we can study the cell to know the body. You can study the body to know the universe. Three-fourths of the universe is water. Three-fourths of the body is water. And three-fourths of a cell is water. So cell is your cosmic unit. So if you understand the cell well, you understand the universe and the cosmic universe very well. So in the with this background, what exactly would it mean in various scriptures? All scriptures have given dimensions, which is called the third dimension, where even you don't matter. So there comes a phase, you're doing a long commando, you're doing a whipples or esophagus, and you're doing a armcoplastic surgery. After some time, you disappear. And that's exactly when you are in that state of third dimension. Somebody asked, Sunil Gavaskar as to, without helmet, when you were facing the fast West Indian bowlers, how was it? He said, I didn't know who was bowling at that time because I was just a witness. It is truly called the Sakshi Bhav or the step back meditation. Most surgeons must learn to do that. And that's when they tend to observe themselves and can be sometimes laughing about themselves when they finish with their job. Basically, devoid of yourself, that is called devotion, the correct meaning of devotion word, because the, the Indian or the Hindi meaning could be different. The devotion means devoid of yourself. You're done and you are surrendered to something. And that's the correct word is samyukti. When you connect and actually you disappear physically and you connect because that's when you connect. This is a beautiful uh, speech by Martin Luther King. There are multiple speeches you heard of uh, the, the, uh, when he was fighting against apartheid. So this was in a uh, Baptist church. You know, they used to tell us in Hollywood that in order for a movie to be complete, it had to be three-dimensional. I want to seek to get over to each of us that if life itself is to be complete, it must be three-dimensional. So they all have their say on this in this direction. How has it been happening in this part of the world? We've been following the Guru Shishya Parampara. It's taken a bashing in the last few years. And we have converted the mentors into teachers. And that's perhaps the Western way of looking at it. A teacher is not a mentor and explain it very quickly. The relationship was spiritual and it's in three dimensions. Shankaracharya has got his eyes closed and he passed on everything to all of them. On the left is Totakacharya, who was supposed to be a complete imbecile. He was, a, a, as they say, a dim there. So they took him for very, very close friend. And the mentor trained him into becoming a warrior. Those days, the kings would go for a war very far away and they would come back in years. So he requested his friend to bring him up like his own son. When he came back, mentor was ready. So that's jumped mentor and mentoring and mentee came in. Now this is the idea of three dimensions and the mentor will teach you in all three dimensions. Vishwamitra passed on all the weapons, but Vashishta framed him into a multi-dimensional God that he became. A word about fourth dimension that Albert Einstein talked in metaphysics. Meta means after. You all know that. Meta-analysis. So metaphysics was where he says the science ends. Something else starts, which he called capital G because he's too ashamed of calling it God. So that's fine. He said something starts which we don't know. In everyday life, we inhabit a space of three dimensions, a vast cupboard with height, width, and depth well known for centuries, less obviously we can consider time as an additional fourth dimension and theory of relativity was born. Well, surprise, 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 the 10 dimensions, there is a string theory. The six more dimensions in addition to the four that I've just described, but they somehow remain hidden from our senses. They are just around us 
and we can open up. And do you know, hardly any Nobel Prize was earned on any randomized control trial, right? Most of these came out of the dimensions. Apples were falling all, all the time. Newton was the one who found out why are they falling down because everybody saw it. So a lot of discoveries and inventions happened, as you see here, when you go beyond these three dimensions. You were talking about the planets, you're talking about great creations, which are very ancient. You're talking about the helix, you're talking about the music, and that's where you open up. I would like to fit in Surgeon here because he should be an artist who's a scientist and a scientist who is an artist. This is what takes us into the space age and the space era. And you walk into a space of positivity. If you are happy with what you're doing, your dimensions get better. They give it back to you, you do even better. A word about the notion of happiness. It was discussed time and again. A lot of us as oncoplastic surgeons are very excited about one additional procedure. And we take a kick out of it while the patient may not even care for it. And very often it is the surgeon who gets excited rather than the patient. And we take it too seriously. And that's how probably one bite here and there. This is 2002, a small cancer. And I wasn't very, very, very keen on any conservation at that point of time, let me be honest with you. But this lady just refused mastectomy. We didn't have a choice. And I didn't actually follow any oncoplastic principles here. There was a lump here. I made an incision on it following the lines that we all been learning about for the last three days, we could do through the same incision level three, retracting the pec minor, that's now to serratus interior, simple gladular mobilization, pillars approximated, it's a simple suture put. But if you look closely, this is 2002, but if I do it now, I'll be concerned about this depression that happens here. I would fill it up with LICAP. Now, well, that has changed in the mind, but patient was happy. In fact, supremely happy, still living, eight, 19 years, where is the problem? So many a times we take a decision simply assuming that we tell the patient, this will make you happier. Well, that's not true. And the patient becomes the center of our decision making. Well, I would not bore you with a lot of my story, but a little bit I thought I must share with you because there was a talk on whether you need to be trained in surgical oncology before you do breast surgery. For that matter, subspecialization in general. The concept in the US is you first get trained well as a general surgeon. It's seven years, which includes your residency. Become a good general surgeon before you branch off into any organ. They aren't too obsessed with, with due respect, various degrees. And so it's training saw degree versus degree saw training, as they say. So it's it's the former which is better. If you can have the degree as well as training, that's an ideal combination. So from a cancer surgeon to a breast surgeon, did I learn something? What was the journey like? I didn't know much about it, but it was fascinating. So I'll take you back to the initial days as I trained. This is Jacobius in a patient with ascitis. He had put in a little proctoscope and then a cystoscope to look inside. It says urinary bladder cancer patient. And he was trying to peep in with a torch. And that was the beginning of minimally invasive surgery. And he looked inside and my boss gave me a thesis topic on diagnostic laparoscopy in intra-abdominal lumps. I knew nothing about it. He knew nothing about it. It's just that he had bought the equipment. The department buys it. You got to do something. So it was given to me. So I asked him, I don't know about it. Please teach me. And in any case, it didn't excite me looking through a little hole as a peeping tom, looking for something inside rather than those big incisions going in, resecting out things. And there you are, we are trying to use this old laparoscopic machine where you have to get this gas cylinder refilled and many, many times. You don't have a screen to watch. This man was patient with me. Most people will show me away. You are wasting our time, go away. So I'll beg them, if you're doing a laparotomy, let me put, let me put my scope. I'll finish my 50 cases and forget about it. Actually, I decided I'll never touch the laparoscope again. But he told me, look, I don't know how to do it. You learn from somebody. So I went around, nobody was doing it. And it's back in the 80s. So I went to the gynecologist, which, which is where they were actually doing the lap ligations. And I ran into the gynecology operation theater. They were naturally thrilled to see a surgeon coming to learn something, which is always a joy. And there was the gynecologist on top of a stool with the table up, 
head and down and it's almost making a chopper out of the patient looking for this thing and she showed me the appendix for the first time and I was delighted. I recorded it for, as a case, that's how I was interested in it, but nobody taught. And I was thrilled when I could use an alligator forceps to make her take a biopsy of a liver metastasis and I recorded it. But my whole idea was to finish with my work, forget about it, 50 cases done, thesis done, I'll crack my MS and move on. But he was right, I was wrong. This did become the future of surgery. I actually didn't understand it because I had unidimensional approach. I wanted to just learn quickly, move on. That's not how it happens. Maybe I could have done better with it at that point of time. I abandoned it and this kind of took me away from it even further. So basically friends, we do not learn for school, but for life. And a lot of learning happens in a copybook manner where we end up picking up the copybook stuff while life is different. Each patient is different. There's no one answer for all the cases. There can be a situation where for even early breast cancer, patient wants a mastectomy. It's a uh, gynecologist I'm talking about. In my own uh, medical school, she's head of the department. I wouldn't name her. She's retired now. She had breast cancer early stage. I asked, offered her breast conservation. She insisted on mastectomy. I didn't have a choice but because she was right in thinking whatever she had to think. I had to explain to her mildly increased local recurrence rates. That's, that's, even that is debated now. She said, why should I even have a ticking time bomb? Get the breast out. I don't really bother about it. So that's what I'm trying to say. So it's not about cracking an exam or getting a degree. It's about learning as you go along. You had a session in the morning on benign breast diseases. So much of learning happened based on practical experience. Shar Sutra in multiple sinuses. I think many people will take it home and practice. Friend's sight is a faculty, but seeing is an art. You may be seeing things differently and that's what matters. Well, so I was hooked on to the whipples, where you get to the last possible cell or the thread or a shred, radical cholecystectomy, I'll get the thrill and joy out of it. it. It was almost like meditation, number of hours taken made me even better. You never felt tired because you never get tired of doing what you enjoy doing. And these surgeries threw that challenge. And just was happening as another surgery that you could do with due respect with lesser amount of effort and maybe relatively less amount of technical expertise which I'll take back my words I had to eat it later commandos or total thyroidectomy with central neck dissections I did lots and lots of work on neck dissections published three books had a necklace the next one is coming out soon I still enjoy doing it all, all these surgeries are special in their own way they teach you about a wrong notion that you just cracked your MS and you're done with your training of surgery, you jump into breast surgery and you become a breast surgeon. You got to be an overall good surgeon to be doing that job also well. Like a lot of senior people here, they've taught generations of teachers now. And as you can see, the, the total central leg dissection done up to thyroidectomy, radical parotidectomy is for referred cases which we get in plenty at our place with the refer, refer, referral center where you have, you can see the patient at TAS or FE here coming from a medical school where we had to do the radical parasitectomy where you remove the entire thing along with a part of the ear and reconstruct it yourself. It was taught during those days and I'm sure it's taught even now, the ablative surgeon should not be the reconstructive surgeon because you'll always be thinking about reconstruction, something that happens in breast surgery very frequently, then you may miss out on the margin. Therefore, I was repeatedly saying on day one, the cadaveric workshop, it's onco first, plastic later, get the patient free of cancer. So this lessons I got, commandos, they make a very fascinating surgery to do. Is an aggressive approach justified in management of an aggressive cancer? Where was there a choice? A question that Adil raised, the kind of cancers you get will decide the kind of treatments you offer. It's not that you will, uh, I mean, ape the trials done in the West, find local solutions to your problems. What do you do for this? This wound is not going to settle with any kind of chemotherapy, radiotherapy. In any case, they are radio resistant tumors, very poorly vascularized, needed a central segment and composite resection of the commando, right sided radical neck dissection, left sided modified. And in a breast meeting, why am I showing this? I'll come to the point. So I'm not trying to drag you through this or resecting. Big areas, reconstructing using radial artery forearm flaps, sometimes getting the plastic surgeon services, sometimes not getting it. Interesting case of head and neck soft tissue sarcoma record, our own 
employee in the hospital, retired, never got it done, never took radiation, came back with maggots and a wound, and it's a recurrence. Uh, we know about soft tissue sarcomas, recurrence, 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 the three R's, the mnemonic, and you have to resect it. You don't have a choice but to get the cleanness, and you have to get the wound sorted, and you have the right-sided neck dissection done, and we keep talking big deal about the lie caps. This is a very old lyca that we used to do, the facial cutaneous lateral intercostal artery uh, based flap, which was initially random. Then we realized that these are the perforators. It became axial. And now we know the perforators. It's lyca. You can be more specific. So it's, it doesn't change as science. The art keeps changing as we understand it better. Had to be reconstructed like this, etc. Skull based surgeries, they, 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 they actually are addict, addictive when you get into that field. Resection is massive. You've got to get the whole tumor out. It has to be R0. There is no shortcut to getting cancer cured. You must get a clearance, which is to the last cell. And you can see the, the eyelid is exposed, a buckle, mucosa cover for the eyes, and a radial artery forearm flap. And they have a better quality of life. Patient lived, had a recurrence again after six years, had to be redone. Another case of uh, Thyroid cancer gone bad because of the incomplete surgery done earlier. You can see the scar. Patient coming with a stoma, naturally the airway is gone. It had infiltrated into the pharynx and larynx. The blue total laryngectomy, bilateral neck dissection, radical on one side, and preserving internal jugular vein. You can actually see the nasogastric tube here. The anterior wall of fringe pharynx is gone. Don't have a choice but to cover it up with delta pectoral flaps. And coming then to the breast cancers, you get these. This is what I think Dr. Anurag was mentioning yesterday in the Twilight talk. Actually, it's a very, very nasty tumor. It was in such cases that you realize, wish we had got the whole thing done more radically than we did. So there the point is very well taken. Or these cancers that keep coming. Or fungating masses, uh, which is it's a metastatic disease, but you need to remove this tumor, even if there is metastasis, this is going to fungate. This wound doesn't heal and palliative radiation doesn't work very well here. When they're especially bleeding, our radiation oncologist is not very happy. You can resect it and this is a Lyca, Lyca flap, which is facial cutaneous flap, transposition flap, which can be done. Another phyloids, which has gone bad and etc, etc, etc. So this is a bleeding limb, a hemangiopericytoma. You don't have a choice but to be aggressive with it. So uh, all I wanted to highlight was never be ashamed of your own story. It's always special. You could be doing mastectomies in the backwaters where you have no choice. But let me tell you, on the table, a well-done mastectomy gives you 25% five-year survival. And that's not bad at all. So one should be ashamed of what one is doing. You can only do as much as you're permitted to do. Patient may not be able to travel to centers. It is easier said than done. If you don't know oncoplasty, refer this patient to some other center. It's very, very hard on patients. They can't travel that far. We have very limited radiation facilities in this country. So we should be careful about offering them what we can offer the best. Well, just to touch a few things, and I promised it won't be technical, it won't be academic, but this came in to make sense later on. We moved from cure or cosmesis to cure and cosmesis. That's a paradigm shift. And the good thing about being born in early 60s uh, is that you've seen the world change over the years, you've seen all these trials happen. You've seen the attitude changing. We have seen radical mastectomy. We've seen simple mastectomy followed by radiation as a therapy. You've seen the B4 results. Then we saw the B6 result. Then we saw the uh, axilla getting, uh, the, in, 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 uh, the intervention getting reduced more and more. We had the, uh, you know, the B32, and then now we are talking about Z11s, where you may not even address the axilla with one to two, three cent central nodes positive. And now also the radiation being an option. So as it evolves, we evolve with it. If our dimensions are all right, we'll absorb it, not unidimensionally. And even here, we'll be flexible. You can get these kind of results with round block, with resorty. You can offer patient a wonderful quality of life. Patient deserves it. And for as long as the patient lives with the breast, they should be, a, there should be a breast or a lie cap, or, or you can do reduction memoplasty. But friends, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. And it is in practice that you live. You don't live in a theoretical world all the time. 
we did a survey uh, when I was the editor in chief uh, of Indian Journal of Surgery that was among surgeons, and we had sent 60 questions asking surgeons what would they want on themselves if they had that particular disease. And that included a journal spectrum, including laparoscopic hernia. Most of them didn't want laparoscopic hernia on themselves. They wanted an open repair. The, to the patient and in the conferences, they'll harp on laparoscopic hernia repair. Well, well this, is, this was a survey, and we observed that a lot of them would go for mastectomy rather than conservation. So many things are related to awareness, but more with physicians or, or providers than with the patients. So a good mastectomy and 10 commandments and put it down as an editorial at that time, which had maximum hits at that time, because it made sense to those who are actually doing it. Doing a good mastectomy and making it better should be also our intention. Because, because I'll just share with you the data world over how many mastectomies are done. You can make it better with the lower pole tumors, smiley incision, which closes with a smile. All we need to avoid is upper and the medial quadrants, which are called the no man's land. These are the parts which are visible to the world or the lady wouldn't want anything there. And also getting into the axilla should be avoided. We should end at the anterior axillary line. But getting into the axilla, one, it doesn't help. Two, it exposes that scar as a part of the disease for radiation. So you'll, even if you don't want to, you'll have to irradiate the axilla. How do you avoid that? There are oncoplastic mastectomies. You can take the lateral limb up. Or you can, if that's a lump located in the upper outer quadrant, or you can actually uh, make a fishtail, fishtail uh, plasty as was presented today. And this works very well. And we've been using this for now two to three years. And we saw Dr. Anurag, Dr. Krishna, all of them talking about it. If there is a, uh, there is a, there are multiple lumps, we will use a lazy S rather than a oblique incision. They're all gone. And very rightly brought out yesterday in the lymphedema session, which was an outstanding session. We don't have to go in the zone, which is going to be involving the lymphatics that traverse and jump the level ones and twos to get into level three or the arm lymphatics, which can be saved. You can use a lazy S. Or if a lady is obese, has uh, decap uh, breasts and is got ptosis and she is not fit for any kind of reconstruction or implants or she is not willing for it, you can offer Goldilocks uh, mastectomy, which is a vertical wise pattern mastectomy where we actually use the flaps to be deapathized and we fold them inside. You can even use an implant with it and you can have a Goldilocks mastectomy which gives a mount and this lady is happy. As long as she is happy, her world is happy, we shouldn't be too fussy about it. So this is, these are options. So uh, can we find, like Fiona mentioned yesterday, this article I shared with her earlier, integrative oncology can we find Indian solutions to universal problems for holistic cancer care? I think some bit of it was touched. We should look at it. Can making of a surgeon be a spiritual pursuit? Most definitely. And in any case, even if you don't want it, since we have spirit, we will be spiritual. But friends, some things are true, whether you believe in them or you don't. I highlighted some parts, but there are a few things which are absolutely true. So are we performing more mastectomies than we need to? Yes, and world over. That's the data. Spain, 64%, USA, 36%, Netherlands, 48%, Belgium, 37%. You can see the figure is very high. In US, of course, this is paradoxical, right? And the reason is, instead of one-side surgery, conservation, the ladies would now prefer bilateral surgery with, uh, uh, with oncoplasty. So from most of the trials on breast conservative surgery, if you follow the previous trials, the, the end point was, if the best breast that you got was at least as good as the one that you had to operate. But today, can we make it even better? That's where it is aiming. And it was shown in the extreme oncoplasty session yesterday. And what are the reasons in most of these countries? Access to radiation. This is our problem too. Spain especially. Doctor-patient attitudes. Many a times the patient would be counseled, and I observed my own behavior over the years, if you convince the patient, they, a lot of them are willing for breast conservation. It's just what you tell them. Many times, if you are not well informed, you won't be able to convince your patient. Otherwise, all of you would agree that we can convince the patient as we want in most cases. Therefore, we should be extremely careful. Screening programs, they made a difference. If you're getting large cancers, you'll have to find something else. And nearly 20% women with breast conservation never go for radiation. And a lot of them are not too keen on going for radiation because of its side effects or they have to travel a distance. 
this is a very interesting uh, the Mazda uh, uh, data that I'm sharing with you. It's a multicentric observational study using evaluating all the MDTs across UK, looking at the rates of mastectomies. Do you know it's 40% of all the surgically treated breast cancer patients still do they miss, there is mastectomy. 89 units registered and they had more or less the same reasons. Big tumor breast ratio, radiation patient not billing, patient not agreeing and the units not counseling very well. So they conducted this data and this is what science does to you. Too much science is also bad science. You just bring in reasoning for everything. Everything cannot be explained. And if you try, maybe you can at some point of time. We never could have imagined maybe 50 years ago that you have a device in your pocket and you could be con 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 uh, communicating with somebody in US live. Right now we are all over the world, across the globe. So these things were imagined as some kind of a imagination of a or a dream of somebody, but they're a reality. So maybe existence, that is the reverberation of energy. If there is a positive thought emanating out of this place, you may not see its impact immediately, but it's like the drop I showed. It may have its impact. And eventually it makes a difference. We are very tightly packed in that sense. Classically, human form into Kalpa Riksha. This is a actually I've taken it out of the Rig Veda description of the dimension. So I put it third dimension here. And it is spiritual awakening went from a psychological mess who's combating the diplomacy, politics, feeling good, feeling bad every day to a situation. Kalpa Vriksha, the term is derived out of Kalpana and then the Vriksha happening. So you imagine good, a tree builds up, which gives good fruits. And it's believed this tree never ages. Under this tree, whatever you ask for, uh, in, uh, when, uh, you will get. So a lot of people get under this tree. There is a tree I'll share with you. And they start asking for pizzas. That won't happen. So it's in the third dimension that you will find it happening. Now, this is, these are the four basic dimensions and Kalpa Vriksha from the Yoga Mala by Vamana Rishi. Vina Vinayasa Yogena Asanadin Na Karaye Toyogi. Do not do asana without Vinayasa. And what that meant was synchronizing with the breathing. Living today and now is what we are all aiming for. But even this moment is past in a moment. And there is no tomorrow because tomorrow will also come as today, tomorrow. So what is it that is the moment right now? The breathing. That's why the entire meditation concept is down to breathing. And all exercises, meditation exercises are related to counting your breathing. If you get down to your breathing, you are in the moment. Otherwise, the moment is moving very, very quickly. That's a Kalpa Vriksha picture. It's a Jyotir Math or Joshi Math, as you call it, and route to Badrinath. And this is where uh, the uh, Shankaracharya did his meditation before he went to Badrinath to create uh, his, his ashram. Did you know that? This is supposed to be a tree where the tea, the leaves don't decay. There's no apoptosis. You know what is apoptosis? The falling of a dead leaf. The term that you use in cells also, when that you talk about the physiological cell death, programmed cell death. So this is a programmed dying of everybody. But this tree doesn't die. I think it must be in the conceptual sense and spiritual sense that you feel ageless. So if you realize you're not aging, you're actually not aging. Others, like somebody was mentioning in the clinical case presentation, three-year-old boy. So you're three-year-old, 10-year-old. So you're old as soon as you're born. Now, because the powerful sixth sense translates, I'm just going to come to the wildlife pictures very soon. So you'll find maybe interesting. Sixth sense translates our five most basic human senses. It makes itself known to us in another way, what we call as gut feeling. And you get a gut feeling, this is going to leak. Better believe that it's going to leak. There's no point being wishful positive. So the moment you find a patient not doing too well in first 24 hours, don't put it on the counts, on the platelets, etc. You know if you've done the anesthesis, whether it's going to leak or not. If you think it's going to leak, it is going to leak. So that comes from somewhere. You have a gut feeling this patient is going to give me trouble. You know that this is coming positive margin. The uncinate process was too close. You know you've been very close to the tumor and there was a gritty feeling. You had no tumor in the imaging, in the breast. You've done a wide margin, but still at the margin you feel it is not looking good. You do a cavity shave, it comes out negative, but you have a gut feeling somewhere it's not right. Very often you find it is positive. When you close both your eyes, the third eye opens, 
you all read more about it. I won't bore you with it, but the concept is related to third dimension. It naturally means if you close your physical eyes, your spiritual eyes open up naturally. If you're bodiless, if you're a no body, you become everything. That's what universe is all about. That's the third eye of Shiva, as they say. And uh, friends, there are only four questions of value in life. It's a beautiful quote by Don Octavio. I often use it and I value it and I put it in my desk. What is sacred? Of what is the spirit made of? What is worth living for? Or what is worth dying for? The answer to each is the same, only love. And love fills all your dimensions and makes it special. I, I personally have not been able to communicate to you anything, but you've received more than I would have wanted because you're also thinking the same. And very often the communication is about just being there. And if you're there, everything just happens. And that's what is called the Sakshi Bhav or being just a witness. And most of us are. Now with your permission, Mr. Chairpersons, I just got a short clip, 10 minutes. Uh, old courtesy, Dr. Uttam insisting that we must have a wildlife clip. Can we play this? Please, please. Now, if you can have the lights off, this is, uh, uh, if I can also see, it'll make me speak about it. Can we have, yeah, this is uh, maybe 10, 15, 20 hours of movie, which has been put down into uh, uh, 10 minutes or less than that. This is Chalana, very close to Jaipur. We'll have our next meeting there, I promise you. Now, that's how the mountain looks. And there you are. That's a leopard. It has got a name. It's called Simba. So there are three leopards, and that's the, it's their story. And fighting it was a real joy. It takes you away from the rest of the world. And you start loving it, and you're in a different world. Now, we were fortunate to have a good look at it. I thank Dr. Uttam for arranging this trip. And uh, although he didn't come along. Now, rolling all around, it's in bliss. It doesn't have to do any signs. And now he finds his prey, and that's his unique dimension. And he starts crouching, getting prepared for a kill, and that's what it's all about. And that's what takes us to being unidimensional, the primary motives in life. I don't know if the sound is on, but uh, if you can hear, there are multiple calls all around. The peacocks of there. They start calling the rest of the world. The predator is on the move. And once they realize that he's busy with the pigs, they are, they are freaking out. Now, but see how it shapes up to go for the kill. Just enjoy for 10, 15 minutes some wildlife clips. There are multiple clips put together, but these are three, um, you know, the uh, leopards whose story will be. There are three different territories, including a territorial fight, if I can show you. Now, it spotted us and then looked around and is looking actually for a bigger kill. That's a blue bull. What do you call his Neil guy? And it's spraying around to mark its territory. Typical tendency to occupy more and more physically and getting ready for the kill. Can we have the sound? Is it possible? There is sound. Okay. That's when he realized the blue bull ran away. He decided to have the starter. And you can see this is the wild hair. And this is the other one. This is Rana. And you can see this is a classical peacock call when it is scared and spots a predator. In our editing, we've made it faster, so maybe some jerks you'll feel. <laughs> The chaos is in the jeep that we are, I mean, it's disappearing in, into the wild now to reappear from a distance. And we follow the call. It's trying to cross, to climb onto the mountain and move to the other side. They're very elusive animals, difficult to sight leopards. I've sighted tiger multiple times all across the world, but leopards are difficult. Now that's a typical mud bathing. And uh, that's a male blue bull. 
right? Freaking out. So now spotted and surprised by our arrival, not too happy. Sound couldn't be heard, growling, and it will go running. You can see the cut at the bottom. Uh, can, you, can you freeze it there? Maybe you can show that. This is the cut. That was in the territorial fight. So they fight for their territory and it's limping a little bit. That's what makes them into man-eaters sometimes. There you are. You can see the cut distinctly now. That's a cut. It's a bite of the other leopard. Now, it was his territory. He was trying to barge into the other territory and that dimension got taken away. And a peacock happily enjoying all the dimensions going in circles. I'll put that YouTube, that story on the Soma website. You can see that that's a very long video. Now that's the other one, which is Rana. He's given it the name, walk like a king, it's elder of them. And this is his territory. Very elusive and it is, may look like we're watching it very clearly and ran across our jeep and went to the other side, the cover of and the camouflage. Well, that's a flower pecker sitting so, so neatly on a flower. It won't even disturb it. Nothing is disturbed. It'll just pluck, pluck out what it needs. That's a throated cart partridge just walking across the road. That's a red wattle lapwing. Did I do it? This is what it says. You heard it all the time. Did I do it? The drongo, male and female, and that's a blue jay, and that's a night jar. Mm. Uh, common Indian pitta, that's a blue jay, clearly seen now. A family of partridges, I'm just running through it. I can talk more about it, but we'll keep the time. That's an eagle waiting, and that's a night jar, actually. The previous one was not. This is a hoopoe that you see very commonly, and that's how the forest looks. You lose yourself in these places, and that's where... You are at another forest, and I'll take you on a trip for the comet. That's a partridge. This is black partridge. Please pay attention to the voice it was making. Ram Teri Kudrat. Wakes up the whole world. That's what it says. And that's a, of course, you see that very commonly cheetah or the spotted deer. It's going to make a call because it is alarming the herd. That's a call. It has been made faster, it just appeared, and that's a king of the forest. That's a call of the spotted deer that you heard. For as long as it is visible, it will continue to call. This is another tiger in the Bijrani range. And we were lucky to spot it very early in the morning, following the pug marks. It was a rainy day, so it was a wet sand, and we could actually see the pug marks. And it is not happy to see us. So I was kind of indicating with my hand the driver to move backwards so that we don't disturb his peace of mind. That's a Eagle, which is a crested serpent eagle that you see in serve only some parts. That's a crest. You will see that in Kana also. That's, a, of course, golden backed woodpecker. And you can very clearly see the gray hornbill, which you see all around you. It's just that we may not know about it. That's a lapwing's little baby. It will tend to stand on one foot. I don't know. They, these are the rudy shell ducks that just take off as you get close. That's an egret, white cattle egret takes off and that's a you know we're just finishing that's a jacana which walks on the leaves and now interesting episode here although we're going very fast this is a can you stop there that's an indian go the only poisonous lizard in india rest are not poisonous the other poisonous lizard in the world is gila monster 
There are no other poisonous lizards. We will not talk about dragons. So it is digging for laying the eggs and it really digs hard and covers it up. Can you please play it now? And to record it, it's a bit of a challenge because it's not a very friendly animal. Now that's a tortoise watching from a distance as to what's going on. But somewhere close by when it must have laid its leg, eggs. That's actually interestingly, that's all cannabis growing. And elephants and langurs are very fond of eating it. It's supposed to be very medicinal and humans have discovered now, Dr. Anurag was talking about using it and I've used it in all lots of stage four patients. Now look at the way, can you go back and show that please? If you can, that cannabis story is a little interesting one. You would wonder why whenever the elephant is not well or the monkeys are not well, they go to this part of the forest in Corbett. And they found out that it is basically because of cannabis. Do they get high on it? I don't really know, but it does help them in their tummy and it improves their appetite. And it's been found that it is an appetizer. It takes care of the depression, please. And they're filtering it out. See that they're getting the sand out of it and really getting only what they want. Rain in the forest is a very special experience. You may get trapped. The small rivulets become, you know, you can see a big herd of the, uh, the deer. This is Sambar male and uh, there's a doe and the, uh, you know, you can see the fawn and that's the white neck stalk. After the rains, the river quietens down and there you are. Camouflage nicely looking at the herd and relaxing as if he cares for nothing in the world. This is Gir Forest, if you ever go, where you see the Asiatic lion, rare to sight it. Uh, and it's kind of been put at very high speed. It came very slowly across. And that's a lioness that had a den close by. And this is the male lion relaxing there. And I think we're just about to finish. Some bit of, just I wanted to give a gist of it. Uh, because I promised it will be the other dimension, not the oncoplasty. In the middle of the night, you can take a look at the moon. This is Californian forest and wonderful skies there. You will see some very outstanding views which mesmerize you and you actually disappear in the, in the, you know, the colors of the sky. And it looks like there's a flame in the forest. And that's the sun setting at Kana. That was some years ago. And see a lot of them. These are rudy shell ducks taking off. And that's a beautiful sight. Can you stop there? This, this is that mountain in the in the forest of California where a very famous climber, I'm just get, not getting his name, he climbed it, and this was the only time it was it could be climbed. It's so steep. And these are forests under fire these days. You hear about it. Please play. Maybe some other time. It's so this is very clean. That's of course a cormorant, and that's a blue jay again. I think we will be more or less finishing. That's pelicans in the Michigan Bay, and that's a ibis. And this is behind my house. I wrote an article on hornbills in my backyard. So this is a gray hornbill right in my lawn and behind in the tree. If you eyes cannot see what the mind doesn't know, they will pass off as crows unless you know it. This is a jungle cock. That's a, that's a crested serpent eagle again. You can see that. That's a crest that you talk about. This is Bandhavgarh. And probably again taking a kill. And that's the Californian forest. Again, you can see a mother bear with two cubs. It goes on, friends. And actually, they've given us more, given us more than we have been able to give them. It's truly a joy to be living those moments and sharing especially picking up a fish and taking off that's the mother beer with the two cups very special picture and that's my brutus can you go back please and that's my dog i don't call him dog because he's super super dog very intelligent and truly takes care of all the dimensions i think we're done and that's shooting an arrow and these are my residents can you stop there i often take them out uh, both of them are, well, this is my registrar, this is my postgraduate. You go on a monthly trip to some bird sanctuary or a wildlife trip. That's the best place to talk to them about life and also surgery. So the class goes on like this. As we enter the forest, I show them all the birds. They note it down in the diary. As I come back, I ask them about the birds. So it kind of becomes a lesson. 
And one such student, student Rohan Khandelwal, from the first batch, I took him out to Corbett. Now he's a very avid wildlife photographer. He's appearing in National Geographic, etc. He went far beyond and a wonderful breast surgeon in Delhi. The team, as we were going around, this is the American College of Surgeons meeting all the residents. Well, that's the best. They insisted, so some percussion. They're all students, now postgraduates. Some bit of tennis keeps you going, and that's where you're back. And with back to the unidimension having seen all around. Thank you all very much for bearing with me. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. That's the Californian forest hollow tree, actually. In honor of President, standing over.